Um, welcome to everyone. A very warm welcome. Thank you so much for joining us this morning on a very, very windy, difficult Washington morning. Uh, my name is Margaret Taylor. I'm a fellow in the post-conflict reconstruction project here at CSIS. Um, we're so pleased, the post-conflict reconstruction project is so pleased to be co-hosting this event with the Organization for Ec Economic Development and Cooperation. Um, we're, we're just absolutely thrilled to be here. We've worked hard and tirelessly to put all of this together, um, and we're, we're happy to have it all come together so well, and again, welcome. I'm going to explain briefly the format for the presentations. I'm going to make very, very brief uh, welcome remarks. I will um, introduce very briefly each of our guests. Uh, then I will hand things over to Mr. Richard Carey, the Director of the Development Cooperation Directorate, which is the uh, Secretariat for the Development Assistance Committee within the OECD. Um, he will do his introductory remarks for about 10 minutes. Um, and then each of the panelists um, will have about eight, up to eight minutes to make some remarks. <clears throat> thereafter, I will open the question and answer session with a few questions of my own. And then thereafter, I will open it up to the floor. We will have two microphones um, for that portion of the event. So if you do have a question, um, please raise your hand. And if one of our, our helpers with the microphones comes over, please uh, state your affiliation, your name and your affiliation. And please do use, make, use the microphone um, and also keep your, your questions somewhat, somewhat short um, as we want to get to as many questions uh, as we can. I'm sure there's, there's a lot of really great folks here in the audience who I'm sure will have a lot of interesting questions and comments. Um, as I was reflecting, reading through and reflecting on the global report and some of the individual reports that, are the sub, the, that we're launching today, um, I, I was thinking that it really provides uh, us an opportunity to, we, and when I say us and we, I mean broadly, uh, the international community, donor governments, implementers of assistance programs in fragile states, um, provides an opportunity for us to really think about whether we're, what we are actually doing is, what we're doing is actually working in these fragile states, because that's so important and that's really the goal we're all trying to get toward, and I think it's easy to forget that in the day-to-day -day rush of you know, getting, getting money for programs, implementing programs, making sure various domestic constituencies are, are satisfied. Um, so I think that this report and the work of OECD DAC is really giving us a good opportunity to think about that in a, a comprehensive um, global way. And that, that's really unique, I think, and we're really lucky to have them. I know as a, as a scholar, I often turn to the OECD DEC website for all manner of information, um, not the least of which is the graphs and all the wonderful statistics, which really put things together globally. Um, so without further ado, I, I will just briefly introduce each of our guests here, and I invite you to um, look at your materials for the full biographies of, of each of the guests. And I just also want to note that this is being uh, audio recorded and also video recorded for the purpose of, we, we will put this up on our website also. So first, doing our introductory remark, remarks, we have Richard Carey, the Director of the Development Cooperation Directorate. Um, he has had a very long career with the DAC, so we're absolutely thrilled to have him here. Next, um, we have Minister Amelia Perez. She is the Finance Minister of the Government of Timor-Leste, which is one of the countries that was the subject of this review. Um, and the individual, so most of the individual country reports are available out in the hallway. Um, she has been involved with this process uh, f from the beginning, as I understand. Um, and she's going to present sort of her experiences from, the, er, experience of hers from the Timor process. Next we have Neil Levine, the Director of, of the Office of Conflict Management and Mitigation at the United States Agency for International Development. We're very happy to have the, the administration, the, the USG view here to share as well. Also a very long and distinguished career at USAID and elsewhere. <coughs> Next is Johanna Mendelson Foreman. Um, we're, again, just delighted to have her. She's a senior associate here in the Americas program at the Center for Strategic International Studies. I consider Johanna to be an expert on pretty much anything. Um, but most recently, she has been focusing on Haiti 
uh, not only what's happened since the earthquake, but before. So I think she will provide just a wonderful context for not only the report, but putting the, the Haiti report, the Haiti specific report, but for putting it in the context of what is, has happened there since the earthquake. And finally, we have Fatima Sumar. She is a professional staff member of the U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Committee, where she works directly for the chairman of the committee, Senator John Kerry. She's an expert on South and Central Asia, and she will be speaking to specifically to Afghanistan issues with reference to the port report, but also the, um, the U.S. perspective on and the congressional perspective on what the U.S. government is doing in, in Afghanistan. So we're absolutely delighted to have all of you. And just one note, there, there was scheduled to be one more panelist named Karen Hanrahan from the Department of State. She called me last night and said the Secretary of State called her into a meeting this morning and she had to cancel. And I said that, that was the only excuse she could give me that would be acceptable. <laughs> so unfortunately, she, she will not be joining us today, but she sends her warm regards and her regrets that she couldn't be with us here today. So without further ado, I will hand things over to Mr. Richard Carey. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Margaret, and um, uh, good morning, um, everybody. It's um, a real pleasure to be here, and it's also, for me, uh, a very significant um, event, uh, my last official event, because I'm retiring at the end of the month. Uh, as uh, you said, Margaret, I've had a long career, uh, 30 years, um, but... Uh, these last couple of days in Washington where we've had a senior level meeting of our international network on conflict and fragility have been one of the highlights because I think we're here on um, a absolutely key frontier um, for the world and um, we're working uh, at and beyond the frontier of this very uh, vital subject. So. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to introduce the first OECD uh, Fragile States survey, but I do want to give you a bit of context uh, before I do that. Um, first of all, um, on, on the OECD, um, what is the OECD? Uh, not a very well understood institution, but it's, uh, it's a place for collective thinking and collective action. And that's what it does. It has a conference center, and every day there's, you know, there are conferences, and those conferences are actually the collective thinking processes of the OECD members, and increasingly a much wider range of countries joining in to OECD activities uh, and joining into um, activities such as this one. And uh, that's why we have Mr. Perez here, who's really a central part of this whole. Um, uh, uh, process and so this collective thinking process is, is getting globalized and uh, in the the DAC we are the place where the donors do their collective thinking about the aid business and again it's being globalized because we have a working party on aid effectiveness that includes uh, scores of partner countries it includes um, the NGOs it includes uh, parliamentarians <clears throat> And it's come up with um, Paris Declaration on Aid Effectiveness and the Accra Agenda for Action, which are the rules of the game uh, for aid effectiveness. They're not agreed by in any institution at all. They exist in some kind of international space, but they are the reference point. Um, and, and it's a process like the one we're discussing today um, on fragile states because the, the INCAF, the International Network on Conflict Fragility, is also one of these um, places for global collective thinking about this whole issue, uh, this very important issue of uh, fragile states. And um, then alongside the network is the dialogue with fragile states, and that's a place where the members of INCAF sit around the table with 15 fragile states in a conversation about what is fragility and what is what are the ways uh, to help fragile uh, states and um, so it's great that uh, Mr. Perez is here 
to uh, tell you how that works from her, um, her perspective. Now, um, what is the problematique? Well, uh, for um, achieving the Millennium Development Goals, the assumption is that we have a set of effective and decent states. And where that obtains, then people flourish, populations flourish. But uh, the reality of the world is that we have 50 or more fragile states, that is to say states where the political settlement is either non-existent, unsettled, or very weak, or where state capacities are very weak. And um, these are also countries which, for the most part, highly aid dependent. So when you have an aid industry working at that country, everything they do impacts on the uh, state building agenda, either positively or negatively, often negatively because nobody thinks, nobody has been thinking of that. Nobody has been thinking of how to provide aid with a state building lens. And uh, so that's what's going on right now with the international network and the international dialogue and uh, with the principles for good international engagement in fragile states which were put together in, uh, after a conference in London uh, a few years ago. Again, um, not any international institution, just a gathering of the actors who produced principles that are the point of reference. Um, and so it's those principles that, are being monit that have been monitored <coughs> and the results of that monitoring uh, 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 in this report which is in front of you Today, now um, monitoring—it's—it's uh, it, it's actually much more than monitoring because um, the way it's being done is through having um, teams who uh, work in the country with the government, with the society in the country, and are sitting down and reviewing uh, what is the performance against these 10 principles. And so it's a conversation, and it's a conversation that actually moves the agenda forward where people can uh, interact with each other. So it's not a set of monitors who are coming in <coughs> from the sky and ticking boxes. It is a process. It's a process um, through which things move. Um, move forward. So uh, I think that um, that's what you need to bear in mind as you look through this report and as you listen to the conversation um, today. <coughs> now, um, uh, we have uh, this reality of 50 fragile states in the world. We have the reality that there isn't enough political capital or political energy to um, focus on um, solving all those cases at once. We know that a number of these cases are so preoccupying and so central to, the, to international security that there is the political capital and energy, although it's, that's also fragile, mm -hmm. as we know. Uh, some countries can't uh, stay engaged, uh, they, they, they disengage. Uh, one of uh, those countries had a change of government um, uh, in Europe uh, this week. So it's, it's a really um, uh, contentious and difficult uh, agenda. So how can uh, the international community provide um, a, a way of staying engaged in 50 countries where we need to be very consciously thinking about the state building agenda uh, in those countries. So <clears throat> one of the ways is through this process and uh, through, the, through the, um, the principles on good international um, uh, engagement. 
and through the thinking, the collective thinking process which has produced these books that are outside, um, do no harm. That is, the aid community thinking very actively of what its impact is in uh, these uh, fragile states. Uh, being aware when they may be doing harm and being aware of where they could uh, contribute to political settlements, to state society relations, to the, uh, the, uh, the standing of the government. Transition financing, you know, when we're putting money into situations of post-conflict and moving to the development phase, how do we do that and how does that help the position of um, the government and the finance minister to uh, have um, uh, sustainable programs to um, uh, build um, human capital and to build institutions. And here, the state's legitimacy in fragile situations. You can't have um, aid agencies going, into going to fragile countries without them going back and thinking about these issues. Um, and of course, you know, for centuries, philosophers have talked about the foundations of the state, and it's not been in the training programs of our aid agency people. But in these situations, you know, people have to have that in their heads. Uh, a bit. So, just to say that this whole process has brought this, the uh, the state building agenda into um, uh, it was bringing it into people's um, uh, thinkings. And then we have in the United States, in the United Nations. Uh, a peace building commission with a mandate to um, really help develop longer term approaches to peace building and uh, to help uh, evolve peace building strategies so that there's a strategy for uh, peace, uh, peace building. So these, uh, I would argue, are um, the beginnings of a way in which the international community can um, deal with the reality of 50 fragile states and make progress on them. Now, um, I've spent quite a lot of time on the, the context of all this because I think it's really important to understand uh, what's going on here and what's going on in the monitoring uh, process. Um, and uh, so uh, we are applying um, uh, the 10 fragile states principles we're measuring how we're doing in six countries, and we've got the results in front of us that are telling us something about the way we're um, managing to behave or, or not managing to behave uh, well. So on, um, in the executive summary, you've got the, the basic um, table that tells you, after the survey of these six countries, how we're all uh, doing. And um, it starts up the top with uh, bold green um, type, uh, which says where we're doing good overall, and red at the bottom, we're doing weak. Uh, so we're, we're weak down the bottom and we're good up the top. Where are we good? Um, the 10 principles, if you haven't already got them, are on this little card here, um, always to be carried around with you. Uh, <laughs> so, um, the, 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 what, what, what we're seeing in this picture is that um, we're good, moderate, and improving on about half of the uh, principles and performance is weak. Uh, moderate or mixed on the other half. So half full, half empty. But as somebody said, at least there's a glass. <laughs> so um, where we're doing well, um, we are promoting um, non-discrimination as a basis for inclusive and stable societies. So uh, international actors there are watching out for um, discriminatory practices and arguing and working for more inclusive, um, uh, uh, stable uh, societies. And um, that's, um, that's, there's a lot of awareness on this, a lot of argument for it. Now, we're not succeeding everywhere. We're, we're, we've got some pockets of very bad um, uh, persisting discrimination, and that's um, uh, in, for example, 
the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, the gender-based violence that's going on there, um, and uh, the use of, um, as rape, uh, of rape as a weapon of war uh, still persisting. Um, so um, good overall, but you know, by no means um, have we won uh, the whole uh, case there. Then um, we go to the moderate and improving section and the recognition of the links between political security and development objectives. That's um, now uh, pretty broadly uh, recognized. And uh, what that means, of course, is that we need the different policy communities here, the defense community, the uh, diplomatic community, and the, um, the development community to be working together. That is what Hillary Clinton's foreign policy is all about. And, and um, uh, there, uh, her um, position is that the diplomacy and development parts of that foreign policy need to be strengthened um, uh, so that the defense part of it can progressively be uh, reduced. And um, this also needs an accent on economic growth to um, get a the, the growth process going in a fragile state so that it begins to um, uh, help with the, um, the reputation of the state and all of the factors that can disrupt uh, the state like uh, youth unemployment and, uh, and so forth. Um, but getting these three policy communities really to really act together is, uh, is still a, a huge frontier. Um, and uh, differences of terminology, thinking processes, planning processes, etc., still make it um, a really difficult um, frontier for us and one we have to uh, focus on. It is, of course, of extreme actuality uh, right now in, in places like um, uh, Afghanistan. Um, the, the nub of the, of the problem right now in many ways. Now, um, um, principle seven is also in this moderate and improving uh, category, aligning, aligning to local priorities according to context. So um, that, uh, that donors are working with governments and um, that the government development framework is the development framework. Um, there is much more conscious this, that that is critical, that if um, there are 20 donors in a country and they all come along with their own priorities and programs, that's a recipe for destructuring the government. And it's got to be the government's own program that, uh, that the donors play into. <coughs> and then on agreeing practical coordination mechanisms between the international actors, there are so many international actors that this becomes a huge problem in, in itself, of course, and finding the um, the, the mechanisms, the discussion mechanisms in country, but also the financial mechanisms to uh, make this work is uh, really hard. We, we've rated it moderate and improving, but still huge amount of work uh, to do on that and uh, work on instruments like multi-donor trust funds, which are going to be key issue in um, Haiti, for example, how a multi-donor trust fund can be set up and work in, in Haiti over a long period of time. And uh, in Afghanistan also, how can the, um, there be much more pooling of uh, donor money and how can that feed into national programs which part the, the Afghani parliament actually um, oversees and, uh, and accountability systems work and national programs are reached out into the, into the villages. So those are um, issues that have to be worked on. Then act fast and stay engaged, but st act fast but stay engaged. Um, so we are seeing uh, cases where uh, there is more rapid response capacity um, and um, there is rapid response humanitarian uh, capacity. Um, now, um, though th that, that's evident in some places, less evident in other places, so that's why it's getting uh, not the uh, full uh, rating. And on staying engaged, uh, we are starting to see people 
uh, uh, work uh, in terms of 10-year partnership agreements, which really this is a long-term business and it makes a very big difference what time frame you're using, whether it's a one-year thing, which is very difficult for the Minister of Finance to, uh, if there's no predictability, how do you plan for investing in uh, human capital, in capacity building, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but um, then we have uh, some countries uh, where there is no engagement or very little engagement like the Central African Republic. It's, it's a lonely country. They feel lonely. They feel forgotten. And that's a country we've covered in the uh, survey as well. Now, um, uh, on the principle of doing no harm where performance is moderate. Uh, uh, sorry, I've skipped over com uh, mixed. Take context as a starting point. It's actually number one of these um, uh, uh, principles. But um, the uh, shared understanding of a given context, you know, you might think that is uh, something that we could do, but we can't do it. It's very hard. It's very hard to um, get analysis done of the context that is really shared. There's lots of it going on, but the process of having it really shared and really shared with the people uh, in the uh, state itself um, is, 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 is difficult. And those of you who are um, in the business of doing analytical work like this um, know that it's, it's difficult and having it shared uh, through political processes uh, and embedded um, in then in programming, uh, you know how hard that uh, how hard that is. Okay, so um, then to the moderately uh, successful implementation, uh, the principle of do no harm. That is to make sure that your program is not undermining the state building agenda. Um, taking away from the uh, state's um, capacities. Uh, by uh, setting up parallel implementation units, for example. Um, these, um, the, 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 this is an area where we're only moderately successful and an area where aid agencies have to be very, very conscious of what um, they are doing. Uh, is it um, doing harm or is it helping? And then focus on uh, the state building as the central objective, closely related. It means that people who are in the position of designing aid programs and working with uh, countries have to have this in their mental framework that actually what they're doing is not this program or that project, but they are trying to help build a state that can function on an ongoing basis and function more and more cohesively and be a more cohesive and effective and decent state, that that is the real name of the game. And uh, so it's, a, it's a, a question of mentality, it's a question of training of uh, people and agencies. There's, a, there's a, a, an agency management and training agenda uh, here that we, um, we are beginning to get onto, but we need to take a lot more further. Um, prioritize prevention. Prevention, you know, is an investment in not having to deal with um, uh, chaotic situations, but we don't prioritize it uh, enough. And um, finally, uh, at the bottom, avoid pockets of exclusion. Um, the, um, the principle where we were doing best was to promote non-discrimination uh, as the basis for inclusive and, and stable societies, and, and we're doing quite well there. But paradoxically, um, we're still having um, uh, pockets of exclusion where, um, uh, which become real, real big trouble spots, which become uh, areas where there's uh, human degradation and um, uh, uh, destabilizing um, trends in, uh, in societies. So um, that's where we are, and um, uh, the idea is that the process will be repeated in a few years' time. Uh, we will continue the monitoring in the context of the Paris Declaration because this whole agenda is now in the Accra Agenda for Action uh, and there's a high-level meeting in Seoul at the end of 2011. So um, we'll bring it into that um, big meeting. But then the process of meeting as we've been meeting in the six countries will continue um, 
over the longer term as uh, necessary um, so that uh, we are working together um, to build uh, effective and decent uh, states. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Richard. Richard has agreed to remain up on the stage and on the panel, so he will luckily be available to field, field questions later for the Q&A session. Uh, Minister Pires. Thank you, Margaret. Good morning to everybody. Um, I'm just wondering how best I should intervene here to make it, to add value from what Richard was uh, talking about, I assume, I don't know the audience, I assume that most of you are people working in either in the field or in this academic field. So I'm just thinking uh, to react on what uh, Peter, uh, uh, Richard was saying in the sense of how people in that field needs some sort of training and changing their mentality. I was actually thinking about that. And I'm thinking the only way for you to really understand the effect of aid in a country is for you to actually work from where we are. It's important probably to get into our shoes. And it's easy. You just have to work in the aid effectiveness unit or the aid coordination, then you will see the challenges that we face in dealing with yourselves. So it's very, very important. I've been lucky because I've been on the two, two sides of the world. And I remember when Richard, uh, Richard was mentioned the Paris Declaration, I remember I was in London when there was an invitation for me to go and go into OECD. I didn't even know what it was all about, this DAC business. And then I went into this room and then they asked me to speak and then I spoke. And then later on, I found out that the Paris Declaration principles came out of all that conversation that I participated right at the beginning without even knowing for sure that this is where it was leading. <laughs> but it's, I want to give you a sense, people coming from our side, often we are participating in many things, but we don't even know what is it, what is the impact. Because we don't have time to analyze things. We don't have time to sit back, reflect, and then see the, the impact of a policy, actions, etc. So this is why I welcome sessions like this. Nowadays, I take time to participate because it helps me also reflect back on what we are doing and how to improve and how to influence the global policies. The other um, uh, kind of uh, event that was like, for me, it, it was important is that I also landed in Accra. So I landed in Accra at the invitation of an, an institution, again, thinking, okay, I can go there and share the experience, so what's the big deal? Then as they were talking, and they were talking about how to monitor the international um, actors when they are engaging in, in, in the country, they go, whoa, there's something here for me. I might as well make an ally of these people. And so when there was an opportunity, I offered Timor-Leste to be part of this pilot project. Why? Because I couldn't coordinate these 46 donors anymore. It was going over my head. I just, either I gave up or I engaged part of this whole process. And so this, I had an agenda, a hidden agenda <laughs> to be part of this because I needed somebody big as like OECD to help us monitor those donors because they're big, they're not small. And I tell you, they bully you <laughs> and we are too small. And so I thought if I, if I get this ally, uh, ally, then I will be able to speak and then understand a little bit more and then maybe influence the, the, uh, the behavior of, of these donors. In Timor-Leste, we have 46 donors. It is good because that means they want to help us. But it's also kind of a nightmare <laughs> for us. Like, it is really hard. But I have to tell you, because we are able to sit together and be very honest, be very frontal, so we found means and ways 
to kind of help each other to coordinate. Because at the end, when I'm right at the end of my tether, I just say to them, if I fail, you fail. So what do you want to do now? Either you help me be a success story, then you are successful as well. So for me to be successful, you better listen to me. Because if I listen to you, I may fail. And so we go like this, you know, kind of blackmailing each other. And, and, but then at the end, we find, we get to where we, uh, we agree, and then we move on. I just wanted to give you a bit of uh, some examples, real cases, examples, so that you can kind of, um, if you are facing with that when you are out there on the field, remember these examples. When I, f when I get, came back, went back to Timur after Accra, I was so excited. So I called a meeting with all the donors, and then I showed them the Paris Declaration. I said, all your ministers signed this, okay? And that's what they promised in there, to do this, this, and that. And then I was very keen, because like these principles were beautiful for us. And there, the, in, in one of them says, use country systems, do this, do that, align your prog uh, programs to the priorities of the country. So I said, this is what your minister, and I have access to them. If you don't do this, I'll make a phone call to say that you are not doing it, or OECD is going to monitor you, and this and that. <laughs> and then one of them said, Minister, we really want to help you out. But, for example, I said, why don't you use our systems? So he said, can I be honest with you? And I said, yes, for sure, go ahead. So he goes, well, Minister, you don't have capacity. That's why we can't use your systems. They are weak and etc. cetera, you know, like this, you don't have the capacity, we want to liaise with this, we can't get this ministry here, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So I said, yeah, pour it all out, because then I will answer. And so after that, I said to him, yeah, now you tell me you have capacity, yeah? And this was an agency, okay, this was not a donor. So I said, how do you have this capacity? First of all, you steal all my people, the best people I have, the best brains, you steal them all by paying them higher wages, and then you tell me to pay very little wages because I have to be sustainable. But you don't have to be sustainable, so you take the best brains, you give them higher money, and you pay. And if these best brains are not good enough, you go to the international arena and you bring in the best consultants, paying very high wages, and where do you get that money from? from those donors who got it from those taxpayers who thinks they are helping me. <laughs> and then you sit in that little corner, surround yourself with a big fence because it's conflict. It is dangerous to go out. So you have all these police and security, etc., in these beautiful white buildings. And how are you supposed to help me? I'm struggling in my treasury, trying to deal with this public financial management, free balances, and whatever systems I have now, with people that I you know have, have third grade mathematics or numeracy, because this is what happened to me when I took over the government. I found out that most of my Ministry of Finance, 60% had third grade numeracy. How did this happen? I have no clue, and you know, agencies upon agencies have been in my country. So I said, now what? So I asked him, what are you here for? He goes, I have to help you build your capacity. Then you build it inside my system. Stop building it out there. Get those people, if they are Timorese, pay them and let them stay with me. Pay those international and let them sit in my treasury. I've opened, I'm offering you that. So that's very important, and still hasn't been, hasn't sunk yet. So now, you know, I have a fight in my country because the donors think that there is a brain drain to the government. Because, <laughs> because what I did is, lucky for me, I came up with, you know, we, we team would have a little bit of money. So we said, okay, now I'm gonna match the wages and I'm gonna bring them all back into the, into the system. And so now we are like fighting for those brains. And there was one person who said, you are stealing all my people. I said, your people? Your people or my people? So, you know, it's, it's like that. The other one is context. I have meetings, like now I have like four meetings in a year with all the development partners, with all the ministers, we all sit together, et cetera, et cetera. And then 
the same question is asked. Uh, I don't know if many people know about the history of Timor, but two, they, we've been independent for about 10 years. No, seven years, actually. 10 years, I mean, we've been free 10 years. The first two and a half years was ruled by the, by the uh, UN, and then the Timorese government took over, and then, and then uh, the second government now is, is in place. Uh, but for the, between those 10 years, if you look at our history, every two years we have a bit of a, we have a conflict, and the last one that took place was back in uh, September, uh, February 11, 2008, when uh, my prime minister and president were there were uh, attempt assassination to their lives. But thank God, since then to now we've had peace and stability, and this is where we wanted to share uh, with the international community, with other fragile states, how come we managed to get peace and stability for so long? It's past two years now, because every time, within two years, and we are like, okay, is it going to happen again? Where is it coming from, et cetera, et cetera. But just this context business. Um, often donors, they like you to have like a medium-term, long-term plan. And I didn't understand because there was like so much pressure. We, we need your plan, we need your plan, we need your plan. And there we are there fighting, uh, fighting fires, putting out fires every day because we inherited a crisis. We came into power because of a crisis. My country nearly ended up as a failed state back in 2006. With, even I did not believe that we would make it. But now when I look back, I said, my God, there was a miracle. But it was not really a miracle. So that's why we are in the process of reflecting and finding out what is it that we did that actually contributed to this uh, peace and stability that now we enjoy. And sometimes we forget that it was only just two years and a half where we couldn't even sleep during the night because of, of uh, consequences of that crisis. Um, and so with people that are demanding of us to have this medium term to long term plan, at the end, I just couldn't take it anymore. I said, listen, we need to find out, we need to, to agree where we are now and at what phase of whatever, development or post-conflict or whatever are we. Because that, it doesn't seem, that it doesn't seem to, have, to have a common consensus from everybody of where we are. Because there are different ways of behaving when you are in that uh, conflict, you behave in a different way. You are like with the emergency and stuff like that. You are fast dispersing, getting out there. You don't have to obey all these rules. And then you move on to this recovery stage and you do it in a different way. And then of course, when you go into development, yes, you have to have your vision, you have to have your medium term, long term things, expenditure frameworks, you name it, all these slogans or jargons that are uh, in this documented literature starts applying. But for us, how we did it is we had to take a day at a time, a month at a time, a year at a time. So to satisfy some, uh, some people, we said, okay, let's try to do a plan, but we have to do like a priority for this year. Because there were too many unknowns. Things were so volatile. I had, we had roaming uh, army group, rebels running around the mountains, being a threat to the national security. Petitioners, which were like 700 soldiers that run, uh, walked out from the army. And these people were trained. They knew how to use guns. So all they had was access to a gun, and that's it. Out there, and then we had 150,000 IDPs all over the city, plus some other districts. Youth gangs all over the place. How could we handle that? How could we sit down and do a plan? We couldn't. It was impossible. We had to act very fast. We had to be very flexible. And as, I mean, as Minister of Finance, I had to tune into these things and say, OK, priority for that moment was uh, Ministry of uh, Defense and Security, because without that, we couldn't go anywhere. So whatever they ask me, it had to go. Everything stops, and we process their paperwork. Then solidarity because of IDPs, because these were uh, 
uh, nuclear for, uh, for um, manipulation by others, because there are bad people who wanted to use these guys that are so fragile to make them uh, explode. So it was like we were living today, there may be an explosion there, tomorrow another one there. So we had to kind of neutralize that, balance all these acts. So we did that, and we were so ambitious. I remember, ah, okay, then the international community tells us this, oh, you can't fix these IDPs over, the, it's going to take you 10 years. Now, our mandate is five years. If it's gonna take 10 years, we finished. Like, there will be no other government that can actually handle this, because not one single government can sort that out. The people, they have no more beliefs in any government. And there was no confidence in government at the time, so we had to get that as well. We get, had to get the trust of the people as well, which was gone at that time. So it was really anarchic at that time. So we said no to the commu international community, we said no way, we're gonna have it within one year. But in reality, we managed to do it within less than two years. We put them all back into their, their um, um, uh, original place. But with a lot of, you see, this is the thing, you know? Often some, some agencies, they can't change their mentality. And they keep telling, we need some positive support because we are already out there, you know, with these big problems. We can't afford to have you coming in and say, you can't do that, it's not going to work, and this and that. We are also human beings. We need to know, to be a bit secure uh, that we are, taking chance, but we were lucky because we had a prime minister who used to be a guerrilla fighter. He used to say to me, why are you listening to these people? <laughs> okay? Am I your boss or not? Sometimes, because I used to go there and say, oh, you know, they are saying this and they are saying that and this and we cannot do that. And so he said, believe in yourself. Do you believe it? Go for it and do it. I'll be here, there to back you up. And so we did it. And so we did a few things. We financed those uh, IDPs. We gave them direct money uh, without any go-betweens because normally the practice is you hire an NGO and the NGO is gonna go and help the IDPs and the IDP says no because the NGO is gonna take all their money and then we have nothing at the end and they are the ones like, oh my gosh, there was all that stuff. So we said, okay, we'll sit together. We sign a contract between you, you and me, people to people. You don't trick me because, like I said, oh my God, they will take that money and they'll do something else. So what? Yes, but they move back to their places, but you make sure that there is this dialogue that it's between two people, equal, not father to child, because then the child goes spend and then comes back to the father or the mother. <laughs> I need more. So we had to get that out of the way and created that, that um, atmosphere that it was like we respected. I think at the end I said to some of my uh, development partners, I said, you know what, I learned a lesson. You need to treat those people with respect as if it, they were just like you. Pretend, put yourself in their place. How would you like to be treated? And then I remember back in 75 when I was a refugee, how would I have liked to be treated? Like a, a naughty child, uh, someone that you don't trust? What happened? Just because of my situation, I became a refugee, I've lost dignity, respect of a person. Because, so all that, we had to change all our mind setting to actually face these people as normal people, just like yourselves. Then go for, in that way, and then you will find the answer. And I'm so glad that we did it that way, and now they've disappeared. They've gone back, and they're not a burden to us. And so we can move on to the next phase. Now we can move on and we're doing that strategic plan so that finally <laughs> that particular development partner will be happy when we launch it next month. So these Min are just examples. Minister I'm Perez, I, you, you've been wonderful and I think you've teed up. Sorry, excuse me. I think you've teed up some really great, great questions for our next panel.